ahead and launch our meeting as a recording, recognizing that there's a lot of things going on in April. Not only is it, you know, Library Worker Appreciation Day, but it's Native Plant Appreciation Month. <laughs> so you got a whole month here to celebrate native plants. And it, uh, we want to welcome everybody, you know, to, uh, to, to thinking about, um, uh, to thinking about native plants and of course the uses that we're at the, that we, that we think about it. I'll be speaking more about that later in the, in the, in the morning. It's also, um, tree month. And so Washington celebrates Arbor Day tomorrow on the 10th of April. We have to be different. The rest of the country celebrates it on April 29th. So Arbor Day is tomorrow. And so go plant a tree. I want to encourage you to pick up this coloring book, download this Arbor Day coloring book that's available. And it, um, it's a hoot, you know, it, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I poked around at it and it, uh, it's really trying to give a strong celebration to everybody to, uh, um, you know, to, uh, uh, to uh, enjoy and, it, uh, and have fun with, it, um, with everything going on with trees. Okay. So we meet here today on April 9th. Um, you know, we'll be talking about the April to-dos, not the March to-dos. My apology on the slide error there. We'll go through announcements. And then Muriel is here from Clallam County to speak to us about a very significant and important concern we should have regarding the vegetables we're planting and the foods we are eating. So um, this is going to be a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's, it's a very significant uh, uh, morning of learning for us, and we're hugely appreciative of Muriel being able to join us. Hey, a lot of birthdays here, and I see Brenda and Midge are on. Happy birthday to you both, uh, Gloria and it, uh, and Anne and Karen also have birthdays this month. So it, uh, not a lot of birthdays, but uh, Midge and Brenda, thank you very much, you know, for your service to us and happy birthday, hoping for many happy returns. Lots of things going on this month, right? You know, this Saturday, right? This Saturday is training session number four on food production. Um, and so we'll have um, sessions, of course, at all four locations across the two counties. We encourage everybody who is participating and volunteering to, um, uh, to, to, to join in. As we were commenting even before the meeting began, you know, we're having a great, um, you know, it's a, a, a great time of, um, of actually supporting our interns and learning along with them because uh, there's a lot of new material. And it, uh, you'll be especially, uh, you'll have an especially fun time this Saturday with the props that Jan has so generously created for, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the training. So it, uh, you know, so it will leave you intrigued as to what you will find for your, your props and your, your games, uh, as you will see on Saturday. Reminding our board meeting is tonight at the foundation board. It's at 5.30 PM. Um, you know, we'll have it, um, uh, it, uh, it uh, everyone is welcome to join, not just our board members. Uh, study group is at Val's home next Monday. So not on Zoom. We're over at Val's. You know, Val, you have any comment or at, um, any, any thoughts in terms of, you know, what, what folks are going to be seeing and how, that, uh, how the study group is going to lay out next, next Monday? Well, what I'll say is I have Eco Lawn in full bloom. All of my natives from A to Z are all budding or blooming. Everything lived through the winter. I'm very grateful for that. And there's been a lot of development on the west side, which is the rain garden, and the east side, which is my personal pollinator bed. And uh, there's just a lot of stuff going on over there. So I, I just, I'm just finishing up my second drip system that surrounds the rain garden. So um, I've got just a lot of program priority stuff going on in my yard. So I'm really looking forward to having people come in who weren't at the home and garden show. So I, uh, I had wonderful um, docents, Barb and Aaron are two of whom. And so please come by and see the progress because there's been a lot of progress from the half inch plugs that I planted showing on the top of the soil. So come on over. There may even be a food treat. <laughs> Don't touch your fingers. Midge, you have your hand up. You want to comment?
you're on. Go ahead, mute. Go ahead, Midge. Okay, Midge, <laughs> if it, we'll come back to you if there's any other thoughts. And then, of course, on the 21st, right, you know, uh, the Sunday, the 21st, at um, a, a dog, bar, dog barn program at the fairgrounds, spring gardening mm -hmm. tips for the Pacific Northwest. So, it, um, you know, lots going on this month. Do take advantage of it. It's, uh, it's all at the, um, all this details, of course, are uh, in the e-news. A couple of things here I wanted to mention is that um, uh, we had a number of folks that uh, struggling with that, um, uh, with Zoom, uh, getting on Zoom and various Zoom meetings, I want to encourage everyone, um, if they haven't already, to make sure that they actually have downloaded um, the Zoom client. There's a desktop client that Zoom has uh, um, uh, available, and it's it, it's an easy free download, and it um, that download will put a little uh, button on your toolbar. And on that toolbar, it becomes much easier then to actually uh, to, um, join a meeting based solely on having the meeting ID and the, the meeting password. So you don't have to be stressed about getting the URL just right. Uh, if um, some browsers have um, spam detectors and uh, ghostry um, protections on them, and so some Zoom URLs may not register properly. So I want to encourage folks to be thinking about um, uh, uh, having a Zoom client um, to make it uh, to make sure that you can um, you can simply join uh, a meeting based uh, knowing the meeting ID and the password. Okay, Eva, I wanted to reach out to you, and I see you're on here this morning, and it um, I, I neglected to actually pick up that um, the 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 picture that I wanted you to share that I wanted to share uh, with you. Uh, from you, but are you uh, you ready to share a little bit about some of the photos that you took and that you, or in the email in the e news rather? Oh yeah, I not much to say about them. They're they're just um, photos from the yard, but um, it's such a beautiful time of year to be photographing. That uh, yeah, my favorite time of year. Any comments in terms of how you were able to focus on the petals and on the color and so forth, and and just you know, and just you really zeroed in on these on these shots. Really, really, uh, uh, the technique was outstanding. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I really do. Um, I just like to get in really close, and that's often my advice for people when they're shooting um, florals. Is when you think you're you're in as close as you want to be, take yet another step in closer. And um, our phones even anymore have great crop features. So yeah, I, I really love the, the little details on the insides of flowers or what attract me the most. So yep, that's what I try to do. But thank you, I'm glad you like them. Congratulations. And again, these are at the tail end of the e-news. So if you haven't, uh, if you haven't um, seen those you know, already, um, do, uh, do pick up on them. Okay. So just a reminder then, is that, um, and as, I, as I say here, everyone, especially because we have um, uh, new people and interns are joining us here this morning, that um, not only do we have the public facing website <laughs> that we have, but we also have the, uh, the, the volunteer site, the volunteer portal, the MGV button, which is uh, tagged right on the home page. And that, of course, will take you to where all of our secret info and the secret handshakes are, mm -hmm. uh, are located. So lots of good info there, of course. And it, um, this is, of course, where our, our official repository um, uh, of official documentation is captured. Of course, also on that home page is a link to Give Pulse. And so a reminder there, of course, you know, that, um, that Give Pulse is where uh, we need to be consistently recording our hours. Um, so that we're not getting a, they don't get away from us as we move into the year. Quick reminder, of course, about who we are. You know, we sit here and meet today as a foundation. This is a general meeting of our foundation. We're a nonprofit corporation recognized by the IRS and by Washington State, whose sole purpose, right, sole purpose is to gather and support our Master Gardener program uh, financially. Uh, through continuing education and through and, uh, engaging with uh, our volunteers. The program, of course, is actually administered by WSU Extension. And, it, um, and this is, of course, you know, this is, this is what we all do in terms of remaining certified and ensuring that science-based, research-based information is provided to our community. 
Your board, of course, is led by Elizabeth and uh, President-elect Mike. Uh, at, um, uh, I'm your vice president, of course. Your other officers are, are listed here. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity for everyone to stay engaged, and for it, uh, and this is why we invite everyone to join our board meeting tonight. Um, um, uh, it's uh, important that you have a stay, uh, have a say, and it um, are uh, have a, uh, you know, and have your voices heard relative to actions of the uh, of the board. We have three different regions across our two counties, right? You know, so Renee, Val, and so Sheila lead the groups in each of our regions. And it, um, and they're, you know, very active groups and, uh, um, uh, and very significant relative to the activities we have going on. We're still awaiting appointment of a, a new liaison educator from WSU Extension. Um, as we mentioned uh, prior to the, um, the meeting actually recording is that Pacific County is actually looking for a part-time 4-H coordinator. Um, and this was a role that Tony, um, you know, our former liaison um, educator served. And uh, a WC Extension is actually gonna host a, a, um, a temporary position for an individual to manage 4-H here in Pacific County. So if any of you are interested or know of someone who would be interested, please at, um, uh, please at, um, uh, get over to um, uh, you know, Sue Carbaugh at the South Bend office. Wendy and Alina are our coordinators. Remember, we are only one of, um, uh, I think one of two counties that actually support our coordinators and we have our master gardeners as coordinators. And at um, Alina's course is moving out of the area in 2025. So we're looking for a new and additional coordinator to support Wendy once we get into the year. So this could be at, um, this is an opportunity for everyone to step up and for consider joining Wendy as a coordinator beginning in 2025. Okay, so we jump into our April to do's per our OSU calendar. And of course, this is the reminder of, you know, uh, this is the reminder to be thinking about a garden journal. Uh, and it, uh, and it uh, you know, as, as, as climate changes and as weather evolves, just as we were talking with Cindy earlier regarding the freezing conditions she had up there in it, um, you know, in that, uh, in the, in the, um, in near hump tulips just last week, you know, the th um, uh, 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 conditions change so radically year to year, it is imperative that we actually have a garden journal to track what's going on. Um, this is also the time of year that uh, OSU is recommending, obviously, to get vegetables in the ground when the soil is consistently above 60 degrees. Now, this is interesting in terms of this is, again, a shout out to WSU Ag WeatherNet. Um, I encourage everyone to be checking on uh, Ag WeatherNet. And by the way, they'll actually they've got a great service now. They actually send out a weekly um, a weekly weather forecast um, email that you can sign up for. Uh, but here is the seven day average soil temperatures in the four locations across our two counties that WSU Extension maintains. And we're still a ways away from 60 degrees, as you can see. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, this is, uh, it's many degrees warmer than just last month, if you recall from the presentation we shared, uh, we shared then. Other April to do's, it's cleanup time. You know, this is the, it's the time to, you know, for it to let the bulbs um, uh, bloom, let the foliage brown out before you remove it. Uh, time to pruning and shaping after the blossoms fade. Time to fertilize manure. Um, optimum time to fertilize lawns. And it, uh, but there's a note here regarding making sure that we're not overdoing it and it um, uh, relative to lawn maintenance. And of course, just as we were talking before the recording began, you know, late spring frost are a reality. And it, um, you know, the, um, the plantmaps.com has a very effective and fun map in terms of what are the last frost dates that we should reliably expect across our two county region. And it, um, you can click on a, on a zone on a particular location and it's uh, color coded relative to where it uh, where frost can come and you can see across the the two county region you know frost risk extends easily in well into may you know and even at the you know even possibly into june you know in some of the higher elevations some of the higher hills so we shouldn't be surprised at um you know at some of the uh, rather frightening 
moderately low temperatures that may occur. And it uh, could really put a damper on our spring planning. Pest monitoring, read and follow all label directions prior to using chemicals. This of course is a, is a very consistent reminder we make to all the people that we talk to uh, in the, as we engage with the public. Um, there is a, a, a shout out to the at, uh, Managing Diseases and in Insects and in Home Orchards, this, uh, this publication uh, from WSU and OSU uh, regarding, it, um, uh, regarding good documentation in managing our fruit trees and at, uh, on our home orchards. And of course, you know, it makes good sense if we're managing weeds while they're still small, you know, you've got an opportunity, you know, to, uh, to, to really uh, uh, to, um, clean up your garden and manage it. Um, uh, once the weed has gone to bud, you know, your herbicides are less effective. And of course, once it's gone to seed, you know, all of your cultural practices are going to be less effective. Planting. Lots of opportunity, as we talked about, in terms of, you know, you know, when the weather and the soil conditions are right, there's a significant opportunity here to go planting. Now, mind you, these are coming from Oregon. So at, uh, when they're talking about the Oregon coast and the Oregon inland valleys, you're actually looking for presumably some warmer temperatures than we may be experiencing here. Uh, but OSU's recommendations, including that uh, we can get some of those, um, some of the, um, you know, some of these vegetables in. And Mira will be talking about some of this just in a few minutes here. So it's going to be quite exciting to think about, um, about um, you know, um, complementing the OSU recommendations uh, with what uh, Mira is going to be sharing. A reminder, of course, about soil testing, the OSU and the WSU recommendations in terms of labs. This is significant, not just from us, but we often get a lot of requests. In fact, we had a lot of discussion at this at the last intern training session back in March about where to go for soil tests and how to get soil tests laid out. And of course, uh, we do recognize that the OSU publication is far better geared towards the home gardener than the WSU extension list which is more geared towards commercial agriculture. Um, both lists, of course, you know, are, are robust and, it, um, and current and, it, um, and, it, um, and the, you know, providing a whole series of options about where to go to get, um, to get soil, uh, soil tested. Okay, I wanna get into other announcements and I wanna open it up to folks to be able to share other announcements. I wanted to kick it off by talking about um, the, uh, the the Don Tapio Scholarship, we are as you saw in the e news, uh, the 2024 scholarship level is three thousand dollars. So it is indeed a significant chunk of change that um, you know a graduating senior um, can it um, uh, can apply for. So um, uh, the website here, in terms of the it, um, the applications, is uh, it's on the website. Um, you can reach out obviously to Katie, who's heading the the, the, the committee. Um, any other comments from anyone regarding the scholarship um, program and the reach out? Other announcements then to share. This is Helen. I'll invite everybody up on the 20th in the afternoon from one to three. We're celebrating native plant month with a trillium trek up at Lake Sylvia. And we'll have a display of all the other native plants that are in bloom. And anybody who wants to come early and help will be setting up collecting plants on Friday afternoon. Uh, about two, meet me up at the pavilion area. Uh, and today is Don Tapio's birthday. So this is a oh. real good reason. To, he sounded, I talked to him this morning. He sounded really great. Thank you. Other announcements. Alina. Yes, um, now that uh, I just met with Wendy Balmer this morning, and we both agreed that now that we have plant clinics and workshops uh, all on the calendars, to please remember to send your community and plant clinic event forms uh, to us. Wendy's going to be uh, collecting the ones from Ocean Shores and Grays Harbor, and I'm going to be collecting the ones from uh, South Bend in the Pacific County. So please send them to us in a timely manner. We'd like them a week after the event. Thank you. Thank you. Other announcements? I'll just shout out for 
our committee led by Wendy, who's doing double duty right now, uh, our PNW uh, gardening tips. Um, uh, my mind went blank. Uh, <laughs> we'll be at the dog barn on, on yeah, April. Our workshop. One yeah. to three. Workshop, that's it. <laughs> uh, we haven't had one for so long, I forgot. Um, but this is our one and only this year. And uh, Wendy, if you'd like to step up and say something further, it might be fun. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, we have, we're, we're working it a little bit different than previous workshops. We're actually having six different stations and uh, people will be rotating to stations. So we have natives and flowers and seeds. So we're going to do um, on the seeds, you how to read seed packets and container gardening. We have plant clinic. Um, and soils. Oh, and soil. Oh, I'm sorry, Val. Of course, we're having soil. <laughs> yeah, so it'll be, I, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, please come join us because we do need people that want to help at like the welcome table or to hopefully we'll have lots of people and we'll be able to get them to go around the stations and stuff. So it'll be a lot of fun. So that's Sunday, April 21st. That's correct. At Other announcements. Other announcements? I have a couple of things, Kelly. Um, I just kind of want to remind everybody that uh, we are now, we have a form on the website now for submission of events to the calendar. Um, and it is password protected. So if you were not given the password, you need to check with your regional director. Um, and either they will submit it on your behalf or um, if it's a routine thing, um, you can be given the password. Um, it's on the very bottom of our homepage. There's a red button that says event form. Um, and so you can submit everything through that. Um, we're trying to limit the number of directions information is coming to various people in the program because it kind of gets overwhelming when you're getting, you know, things from 10 different places. So we're trying to that's the reasoning behind it. If anybody has trouble with the form or needs um, a, like a tutorial or a little extra help, contact me and I can help walk you through it. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's about it. Does anybody have any questions about the event form? Just thank We've you. Getting so a lot of events that way and it seems to be working pretty well for those that are using it. Thanks to Aaron, uh, uh, Aaron and Vivian for being the uh, technical force behind this and have really uh, leveled it up. I'm just really happy that it really is easy to use. So thanks. And we want to echo how important it is to use this event form, you know, because by using the form, we're ensuring that all the people that can properly promote and engage in these events is being notified. So it um, it's uh, it's um, it, it from an efficiency standpoint and effectiveness standpoint, it is um, it is it is um, is it, it's it's quite important. The other thing I have is um, next Tuesday, a week from today, is Coogs Give, which is a one day um, giving celebration for through WSU, and for the third year in a row, the Master Gardener. Um, Endowed Chair Fund is being showcased. Um, so I just released a podcast episode this morning. I interviewed Jennifer and uh, Shalane Foster, who is the Connors um, Director of Development. So she's kind of one promoting Coog's Give for Connors. And so it explains what the Endowed Chair is and how that's going to benefit Master Gardeners and uh, what Coog's Give is. Um, so if you want to check that out, um, I can also, um, but so we want master gardeners to be ambassadors for the program. And um, this is pretty social media focused, but um, you know, just promoting Coogs Gives, talking about your experiences, telling your story of what you love about master gardeners and um, encouraging people to give for Coogs Give. Um, the, between the um, master gardener leadership team at WSU and the um, Was uh, Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State leadership team combined have created a match 
gift of over ten thousand um, dollars, and so we're we're trying to get um, friends, family, alumni to give so that they can unlock that match of over ten thousand dollars. So I will put um, some links in the chat to to um, for more information. And so, what day again was it? Is the Cougs Give Day? April seventeenth. April seventeenth. Okay. But yes, do push that into the chat. This is indeed significant. You know, we're all indeed hopeful that uh, this endowed position, um, you know, could be a significant um, step up for us as master gardeners to have a seat at the table, as they say, uh, relative to WSU extension. Terry, Rhonda, Robin, any comments regarding our upcoming home and garden show? We are getting close. We are getting close. And um, the show is sold out uh, in terms of our vendors. So um, Robin and, and Rhonda have packed as many vendors as possible into every nook and cranny in uh, both spaces. And uh, they've even rounded up some food vendors this year. So there will be uh, options if you uh, don't want to eat a hamburger or a chicken strip from the, from the refreshment stand. Um, we, we need, uh, of course, volunteers, um, the schedule, the volunteer schedule, thank you to those who have already, uh, let me know that they can help, but the schedule will be going together, um, later this month. Uh, usually it's kind of, kind of, a, a two or three weeks before the show. So, um, if you haven't, if you haven't gotten your, your schedule yet, that's why it's coming. And um, um, cookies, Lori needs cookies. Um, <laughs> it's always a huge mon money raiser for us. So please, please make cookies. And um, Lori needs someone to man the booth <laughs> during the show. And we, we actually have a couple of people that uh, are good candidates for some of the time, Lori. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but if there was somebody who could do it for both days, that would be ideal. So if, if you would like to do that, it would be really great. Um, also, um, we've divided our speaker schedule into kind of um, uh, two, two events. We're having um, our Green Power Day on Saturday, which has to do with, with um, a lot of... Um, uh, veggie gardening, how to extend your, um, their, your growing season. Um, we have a speaker who, who um, is a King County master gardener. I'm going to blank out on his name, but he, he has, a, he is a regular speaker at the, um, at the um, Northwest Flower and Garden Show. So he should be very interesting. Um, on Sunday, we're doing flower power. So we have uh, speakers that are gonna focus on ornamental, ornamental uh, uh, gardening. And uh, Tony Gwynn will actually be doing um, a talk on, on growing violets, which is kind of her passion. Uh, we have Nancy Nesbitt, um, who, are you related, Muriel? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, she has Rhodesia Flower Farm in um, Bay Center. And uh, she's going to be talking about um, arranging and growing flowers. It should be, should be very fun because she's going to have some uh, volunteers help her demonstrate. Um, so... There's just a lot going on with the show and it's gonna be wonderful. Lots of new vendors, lots of favorite old vendors. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just so thrilled for Robin and, and Rhonda because usually there's a last minute scramble right before the show trying to fill up the last spaces. But this year, um, I think it's due to how uh, popular our show has gotten and um, the word has spread from our vendors to new vendors that it's a great place to come. And, and so um, anyway, I think our members will enjoy it as well. 
Yeah, you now watch the last week. A bunch of people will cancel out and I'll have openings, but that, <laughs> that, that happens every once in a while. But no, nope, right now we're full. And so Midge posted that uh, that speaker you're uh, trying to recall, Terry, is Bill Thornus. Bill Thornus on Cool Season mm -hmm. Gardening. Mm -hmm. So Thank again, you. this is it's a huge opportunity for us, you know, at, uh, to show um, our support. And as it um, as as, uh, as 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 Terry and Robin have noted, the fact that the vendors are stepping up is a, is an incredibly significant. Um, uh, this is a significant economic development event for the county and for the region. So it, um, our volunteer effort is what makes it successful. So do be thinking about not just on the Saturday and Sunday of the show, but the setup will begin on that Thursday and Friday ahead of time. So it, um, so please reach out to Terry and it, uh, make sure that, um, you know, that you've allocated some hours to help out. Other announcements, anything else going on? I'm going to make a note reminder then that this Saturday again, once again, is our is our Saturday training. This is the next the next production. Um, um, Sharon, you want to speak to? Uh, we've got James Croft from WSU who will actually be part of that uh, presentation, and it, uh, so there'd be a continuing education opportunity for anyone who'd want to jo join in. Is that right? Yes, um, James is going to be talking on small fruits and uh, berries, specifically raspberries, strawberries, and blueberries. Um, he only gets about 75 minutes, so it's, it's, can't talk about everything in 75 minutes, <laughs> but I haven't actually confirmed with him, but I think he'll be pretty much okay with this. We'll go ahead and record it as we did James Cassidy's and put that in our, um, under our website. So it's protected and we can look at it. Now, I, it sounds like a fun day. It really does. So I really encourage everyone, if you've not stepped up to, to volunteer with the trainees, it really is a fun, these are, you know, these are fun programs. It's really been revamped this year. And so it's a great opportunity for us to learn, to engage, to meet these new trainees, you know, and as, as we all know, the social connections we establish during these training programs are pretty important. They stay with us, you know, for years on end. So mm -hmm. it, um, this is truly an encouragement to stay engaged. And this is going to be a particularly fun class this Saturday. Other announcements? So reminder, of course, they made note to re uh, keep these hours uh, keeping recorded. Um, you know, at, uh, if indeed there's any questions or challenges you have in using the Give Pull system, reach out to Alina, to Brenda, to Wendy. Um, but it is so very important that we keep up with the recording of the uh, these hours because uh, if we it, uh, if we don't, just uh, the next thing you know, it's going to be uh, end of the year, and that you're going to be trying to remember what you did months ago <laughs> and trying to figure out you know where to get your hours put in. Very good. So we are very pleased to welcome here today Muriel Nesbitt from Clallam County, and it uh, and this is a you know this is a you know a, a, you know I, 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 Muriel. Of course, I want you to begin with you know talking about your background, which is just unique. It's in its in and of itself, and then the research that you've shared and you spoke to us at the WS at the master at the state conference last year was so significant and rather rather unsettling. So I, I'm, I'm really excited for you to share with us here today uh, what's all going on. And I've given you screen share privileges. So it, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop share and, it, uh, and uh, let you take over and, it, uh, and welcome you to our group here today. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can get my PowerPoint Okay, select a window or application. Hmm. There we go. So we're seeing your whole window there. There you go. Now we're all set. Okay. So you said I should tell you about my background. So I will do that before I get into the um for before I get into the topic of nutrient decline. Um I'm kind of a lifelong teacher. Um when I graduated from college, I took up a position as a high school teacher 
in East Africa, where I worked for three or four years, then entered the University of Washington um, PhD program in genetics. So after that, I've worked at UCLA and UCSD San Diego, that is, until 2007 when I retired and decided to work back to my happy childhood environment, which was in um, what is now Bellevue, but was now the woods. And once I had a look at Bellevue, I decided no, and uh, looked for a place reminiscent of how it used to be and found Port Angeles. And I have made my, my home there. Anyway, what I want to talk to you about today is um, a phenomenon unsettling, as Kelly said, about nutrient decline in vegetables. And I'm going to show you some data that was put together by a fellow named Alex Jack. And if you can see him in the, the photograph, he's the guy on the left. He is a writer, um, basically, about whole foods and nutrition and healthy diets. And in order to do his work, he has relied upon the USDA food composition tables. So the ones I'm, the charts of his that I'm going to show you um, feature data from the food composition tables in 1975 and 1997. And when he compared those two, he noticed and others had as well, that there had been some significant changes. So I'm going to show you the following two slides, the link to his paper that, can, that includes the charts I'm going to show you is below, but I've also collected all the references at the end, so you can wait until then to pay attention to them. Here's one of the charts, and it's looking at broccoli in 1975 and 1997 based on 100 grams of the edible portion. And what he sees looking at these seven different nutrients that in every case, there's been a change. In every case, the change has been negative. That is, there's less calcium, less iron, less vitamin A, per 100 grams of the edible portion in 1997 than there was in 1975. Or we can look at it the other way, take a nutrient, calcium, for example, and look at a bunch of different vegetables. And what we find is very similar observation that there has been a change in every case. In every case, the change is negative. The degree of change is not the same necessarily from vegetable to vegetable, but the change is consistently downward. So it's interesting to think about how this would affect us as consumers of vegetables, assuming that this apparent decline is a real thing that we have to pay attention to. So... In the United States, we are recommended to consume 100 milligrams or gram of calcium every day. There are little variations that relate to gender and age and so on, but one gram is uh, the average. And so the point here is that if you were to eat, if you ate in 1997, as much broccoli as you ate in 1975, you'd get less than half as much calcium. Or to put it the other way, if you wanted to use broccoli as your source of calcium, you'd have to eat more than twice as much to get your nutrient. So this is going to be a point that I'll emphasize throughout. You can get your nutrients from your vegetables, 
but you have to eat more to do that. And I want to think about what that more is. What is it that you're eating more of? Okay, well, Jack's publication and others created a stir. And indeed, the Rodale Group, publishers of organic gardening and so forth, wrote an open letter to the USDA saying, in effect, what's happening to our food and what are you going to do about it? So the USDA did reply. They said, oh, we see what you're talking about, but we don't think that this is really a decline across the board in nutrition and vegetables. What we think is that one of two things may have happened. One, people who tested for nutrients in 1975 did it differently than they did in 1997. So testing methods have changed and <clears throat> that might account for the change in nutrient numbers. Or maybe we're not testing the same plants. So the USDA says broccoli has this much calcium. What do they mean actually by broccoli? It turns out that the USDA food composition tables are based on the most commonly used varieties in commercial agriculture. So in these do change over time. In fact, in the later, the 1997 report, that would have been Marathon, an F1 hybrid. In 1975, it was different premium crop. So maybe simply the change of plants is what accounts for the apparent decline in nutrients. Okay. So we have a choice here between artifacts of different measurements and different plant choices. So we could ask ourselves, has anything happened in the last century or so that could have actually caused an over-the-board decline in nutrient density? And of course, the answer is a tremendous amount has happened in the past century or so. There was the Green Revolution, the Haber-Bosch method of manufacturing ammonia from the nitrogen gas in air. And a commercial seed company in 1926 called Pioneer, released the first hybrid seeds onto the market. Those were corn seeds. And the hybrid seeds really overtook the market fairly quickly and, and caused it to be the case that the more traditional open pollinated varieties weren't grown anymore commercially and weren't so readily available for home gardeners either. The hybrid seeds caught on with the farmers because they grew faster and gave greater yields. But for the sellers, there's also a huge bonus, which is that the hybrids are not true breeding and therefore the farmers can't save their seeds but have to buy them over and over again every year. So maybe this does account for nutrient decline. It could be because the older open pollinated plants were more nutrient dense, or maybe the synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and so forth have caused changes. So there is a fellow at the University of Texas named Donald Davis, who did a review of all the literature on nu nutrient decline in 2009. And he looked at both observational data, chemical data, and so forth, and divided his types of evidence into three. 
there is the evidence where you compare old data to new data like Alex Jack did. And when he looked over that, everybody found nutrient declines over periods ranging from a whole century down to 30 years. But this is simply a repeat or basically a, a new rendition of what Alex Jack found and doesn't bring us any closer to understanding the mechanisms. However, he also wanted us, or he also talked about a second category which involved the effects of chemical fertilizers on nutrient density. And then a third category where side-by-side -side plantings of older and newer and lower yielding and higher yielding plants were looked at using modern measurement techniques. So first with the chemical fertilizers. So the graph here shows the results from raspberry plants all the same cultivar, planted more or less side by side. Some of them, the white bars, in native soil, which contain 12 parts per million phosphorus, and some of them supplemented. And the supplements were either 22 parts per million or 44 parts per million. The black bars then are the 44 parts per million, and the results in terms of nutrient content, these are all mineral nutrients down here, were <clears throat> graphed relative to the amount in the unsupplemented plants. So to look at phosphorus, for example, compare the black bar to the white bar, it indicates that the amount in um, the supplemented plants is about 122% of what it is in the same amount of the unsupplemented plant. The measurements are based on the whole plant, not just the berries. The plants are taken up, desiccated, pulverized, and then a gram of the resulting powder is measured for nutrient contents. And what you see is the comparison to un of unsupplemented to maximally supplemented goes down for all of the mineral nutrients except phosphorus, which we're feeding to the plants. Some of them go down a lot. So nitrogen is down to 80% in the uh, supplemented. Potassium about the same, calcium a little lower, the biggest effect on copper, and a tiny effect on manganese. So why? The thing that was observed in this experiment is referred to largely as a dilution effect. The idea behind that is that the biomass that the plants developed when they were supplemented was greatly increased, and indeed it was, but that the mineral uptake, although it was increased a little, was not increased in proportion to the accumulation of biomass. Biomass is predominantly carbohydrates, cellulose and starch in particular. So the extra biomass outweighs or dilutes or overcomes the smaller increase in mineral uptake. Therefore, the term dilution. And the dilution effect has been observed over and over again with all kinds of growth promoting substances ranging from irrigation water to the addition of rhizobia to the addition of other fertilizers. Those things increase yield, but what they increase 
is predominantly carbohydrates. Now, looking at the third part of uh, Donald Davis's um, three types of evidence, we want to turn to comparisons of different plants raised together now and measured now by modern techniques. So Farnham, Grusek, and Wang did one such thing. They looked at broccoli head weight, i.e. yield, compared to mineral density using a lot of different cultivars planted under identical conditions as much as possible. And what they found was that yield was negatively correlated with mineral content. That means the more yield increased, the more mineral content decreased. Garvin, Welch, and Findlay looked at winter wheat yields and measured the weight of seeds harvested and against the mineral content of seeds. And they found the same thing, a negative correlation. The greater the weight of yield, the less the mineral content. Now, they did an interesting thing, which was that they also included in their plant comparisons the release date, the date at which the plant breeders released the plant onto the commercial market. And what they found was that release date was also negatively correlated with mineral content. The more recently a plant was released onto the market, the less the mineral content. They only looked at iron, zinc, and selenium, but for all three, they found the same thing. And here is a tremendous study done actually at WSU of many varieties of wheat, multiply replicated studies. And they had, they compared what they called historical varieties to modern varieties. And what they found in their studies that was over all the types of wheat that all of the modern varieties had higher yields than the historical varieties. And all of the historical varieties had higher nutrient content than the modern varieties. Okay, so we are left then with several things that there are chemical things and the other things that you can do to plants that will increase yield at the expense of nutrient density and plant breeding programs that have resulted in modern varieties have also gotten us to a point where we have sacrificed basically mineral content for higher yield. Those are genetic differences, the ones between older and newer varieties and caused by plant breeding. It's not that plant breeders have discriminated against nutrient content. What they have done is to be unaware of or to ignore nutrient content and focus on yield. It's a similar scenario to um, breeding tomatoes for shelf stability and ignoring flavor, for example. Many of you may have seen this graphic in the past. This is published some years ago by the National Geographic magazine. Uh, the part of the display above the gray line represents how many varieties of these different vegetables were available to um, be bought in 1903. And what we see is there were lots of them. 341 squashes, 463 radishes, 
544 varieties of cabbage, etc. Below the gray line, we have how many of those varieties were available still in 1983, 80 years later. And we can only imagine how many are available now. And any of you who are interested in this particular phenomenon of the loss of biodiversity in food crops, I'd like to re recommend a book, which I have put in the reference list at the end, called Eating to Extinction. The author is Dan Saladino. Nice name under the circumstances. All right, so the final bit of data I want to mention in regard to this particular type of loss of nutrient density is this experiment by Scott et al. They were looking at corn, and they measured starch, protein, and oil in, car in corn grains, kernels. They grew plants that were derived from seeds that they obtained, which were released onto the market in the 1920s, 1940s, 60s, 80s, or 2000s. Now, their comparisons yield data which the lines on these graphs are a fit to. And what we see is that graph A, which represents starch, shows an increase from 69.6% of the mass of the corn kernel in the 1920s to 70.8% in the 2000s. Graph B represents protein, and we see a decline from about 13.3% in the 1920 plants down to 12.3% in the 2000 plants. And the oil also shows a decrease. Graph D represents specific amino acids, which are part of what contributes to the graph in part B, so I don't need to go into that particularly. But it illustrates perfectly what we've been seeing up to this point, a decline in everything except carbohydrates. The selection for yield has caused an increase in the proportion of the plant that is carbohydrate. Now, I want to leave this at this point and switch to something else which has been going on alongside all of this and also affects nutrient density. That is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the blue line here shows the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere over the past 800,000 years. The data come from ice cores from uh, Antarctica and Greenland. But you see, in the recent decades, we have a huge spike. And whereas the highest number that was ever achieved in the last 800,000 years is about 300 parts per million, the average being somewhere around, what, 220 or 230, in, at the time this graph was made, we had 402 point something parts per million, the highest ever within the past 800,000 years. And uh, one of my uh, visit occasionally websites is called Daily CO2. And if you look at that, you'll see we're in the 420s. Okay, so what? Well, what would we expect to happen to our plant nutrient density? Since carbon dioxide is essential 
to photosynthesis, it would seem reasonable to think that increasing CO2 would increase photosynthesis, and this would increase carbohydrates and decrease nutrient density. And while it's fine to say, yes, this would be reasonable to expect, it's necessary to ask, is that what happens? And it's hard, a little bit hard to determine that in some ways, because although there are lots of ways to expose plants to increase carbon dioxide, all of them, most of them anyway, change more about the environment of the plant than just the carbon dioxide. So for example, if you put the plant in a bell jar and run in a hose with some carbon dioxide, that drastically changes the environment of the plants. So how do you look at the effects of increasing carbon dioxide without changing other things? And for that reason, people have developed around the globe a few, I think a few dozen, face centers or face facilities, face standing for free air carbon dioxide enhancement. The idea is that you pump carbon dioxide mixed with air into an area from surrounding sources you monitor at the leaf level how much carbon dioxide is in the air, but the area is not enclosed. So rain, wind, insects, whatever, go on as they do normally. And I'm going to describe one of these. This is a very simplified example of um, a decades ago installation in India. And you see there's an eight meter diameter octagon that is surrounded by these perforated pipes. CO2 mixed with air is pumped into the pipes and it exits through the holes into the um, octagon area. The outflow of carbon dioxide is aimed at ground level and carbon dioxide is denser than the air a little bit so it tends to hover near the ground but there's no enclosure no roof no anything of this sort so the idea is to plant some plants inside and have the same plants planted outside and presumably there'll be the same conditions but except for the carbon dioxide. Um, the graph shows that during a particular day, they measured the carbon dioxide and it came out to be about 560 parts per million in the way they have these things set up. They planted some brassicas, two species of brassicas outside and inside. Ambient means outside, face is inside. And in both cases, some of the plants were irrigated and some not. And we see that the reasonable expectations of increased yield are met. In every case, every condition in both types of plants yield in terms of grams per, per square meter increases, not at the same rate in the two species, and not in the same rate with and without irrigation, but increase. So it looks like increasing carbon dioxide does increase yield. Now, since there are these dozens of face facilities, and they include different kinds of plants, some of them are set up in forests, both tropical and boreal. Some of them are in commercial agriculture areas and so on. And they use different plants and they use different CO2 concentrations to extract 
kernels of universal truth out of there is challenging. Um, the technique for trying to get all of the disparate data to mean something is has been undertaken by meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is where you take publications, people have generated data, they've analyzed their own data and reached their own conclusions. And you take the different analyses from different people and ana analyze them so that you have now got a meta-analysis. I looked at two of them, Ainsworth and Long and Loladze. I'll talk about both of them. Ainsworth and Long looked at 124 different publications, 40 face facilities, different CO2 concentrations, different plants. And what they found was that if you look at the rate of photosynthesis as it's going on at the leaf, which is fully illuminated, you find the rate of photosynthesis increases. The rate of carbon assimilation increases and yield increases. Yield doesn't necessarily increase at the same rate because some of the photosynthetic products are consumed by the plant for energy production and so on. Carbohydrate levels in the leaves of the plants accumulated. And this led to a thickening of leaves and stomata on the underside of the leaf became fewer and were open less often. And the measurement of gas flow through the stomata was decreased at elevated carbon dioxide levels overall. Now, another observation was that the soil under the plants in the face facilities tended to be moister than the plants outside. And Ainsworth and Long called this efficient or more efficient water use. And of course, efficient water use would be a wonderful thing because water is one of the things that's becoming problematic as climate change goes on. However, coupled with the reduced numbers and reduced opening of stomata, what this indicates is that transpiration is being inhibited in these plants. Now, this can be a problem. Transpiration is the process by which water in the soil is taken up, flows through the xylem system, and then is used here and there, and part is released out into the atmosphere as water vapor. But what is taken up besides water? What is taken up in transpiration is water and everything dissolved in the water in the soil. And that is where our mineral nutrients come from. Our mineral nutrients are dissolved in the soil moisture, find their way into the plant, up through the plant, and become distributed through the plant through the process of transpiration. So less transpiration, ought to result in reduced uptake of mineral nutrients. This is a kind of startling study done by Dugas or Dugas et al., a Canadian group studying acacia plants. And what they found was that when they put their plants, just picked it up and moved it and then made a measurement so they moved their plants from ambient CO2, which in 2001 or just before was 385 parts per million, 
and put it into the tremendously elevated carbon dioxide of 980 parts per million that immediately the transpiration rate dropped by 50% in their plants. And when they left them in that extremely elevated CO2 level for a year and then did the measurement, it had dropped a further 50% down to 25% of the original transpiration rate. Now, looking at the other meta-analysis, this one was done later by Lola Zé, who I believe is at Arizona State right now. He therefore had more observations to look at, at more face centers, more um, species and cultivars and so on. And he looked at, or I should say, he concentrated his analysis on plant quantity, i.e. yield, and plant quality, nutrient content. And what he found was that, or what he pointed out was that although effects on plant yield had been discussed for a long time and welcomed by some because more plant bulk means more food to consume and we're going to have more people to consume food in the near future. So terrific. But plant quality hasn't been looked at very much. Um, this is an example of the plant quantity fans. Um, a representative from Texas wrote an op-ed article saying that we're going to have a greater volume of food because of increased carbon dioxide. And therefore, scientists and other people saying we need to cut emissions and so forth were nuts. Because what if we do that, we'll cut down on the yield of food. He says that food will also be of increased quality. And that's where he went off track. So with regard to mineral content, Loladze was able to average this out across his face, his face experiments. He, as far as I know, coined the term ionome to describe all of the ions, that is, all the metal or mineral nutrients that uh, he was measuring. He found that average down about 8%. And you see the, um, the fact that the different minerals differ somewhat in, in how far they're used. I think 8% is no big deal. But remember that this is on top of the decreases that we saw earlier due to plant breeding. And those sometimes were as high as 50%. Now, another kind of shocking thing about this is looking at the ratio of C, i.e. carbohydrates, to N, predominantly proteins, carbon to nitrogen. And we see that that ratio has been greatly increased if it's <clears throat> carbon to nitrogen. So any bite of any plant now at elevated CO2 will carry markedly less protein and markedly more carbohydrate than without the CO2 enrichment. Okay, so to make a long story short, when we depend on vegetables for our mineral nutrients, and we do, that those foods are becoming less and less able to provide the nutrients without at the same time giving us increased carbohydrates. 
I assume that the same measurements would be found in animal foods, but I haven't looked there. But the animals also depend on plant mineral nutrients for their minerals, so I'd expect them to show similar declines. So this is the point. This is a lockstep relationship. The very same factors that contribute to a reduction in mineral density at the same time lead to an increase in carbohydrates. Does it matter? Well, Loladze argues that it does. He uh, compares his findings to what is, well, to hunger. And hunger, as he points out, can be divided into different kinds. When we feel hungry, <clears throat> what we mostly are hungry for is fuel, carbohydrates, what produces energy. But we can be hungry as well, not only for calories, but for proteins, because we need proteins to grow if we haven't finished that. And we need it to repair and renew and support our various body tissues. And then there is hunger that we are mostly not aware of at all called hidden hunger, which happens when we lack one or more of our mineral nutrients or vitamins. And this is our problem. This is the crux. Those things decrease in our food, are decreasing, have decreased in our food. We're mostly not aware of the need for those things. And what has increased in our food at the same time is calories. This map shows something about hidden hunger. Um, the light green areas represent portions of the world where there is iron deficiency above a certain level in the population. Iron deficiency, of course, will cause anemia, make you lethargic, tired, less able to do work. The medium green areas are deficient also in vitamin A, affecting, among other things, vision. And the black areas are also deficient in iodine, which affects cognitive functioning and thyroid functioning. So hidden hunger or mineral nutrient hunger is a widespread phenomenon around the world. But at the same time, what about calorie hunger? Well, we North Americans and Europeans still top the charts in terms of obesity in adults. And the ride we are on shows an ever increasing trend. And we are followed not too far behind by the Latin Americans actually tied with the Oceanians, Australians, New Zealanders, Pacific Islanders and even Africa and Asia, not far behind in terms of putting on weight while at the same time being hungry for minerals and vitamins. Now, although the graph shows that we North Americans are among the most overweight in the world, it doesn't mean that we're well nourished. We don't have the true nutrient deficiency syndromes like scurvy from vitamin C deficiency or cretinism from iodine deficiency. But we do have mineral inadequacies or nutrient inadequacies. That is, we're below the amount we should have, but above the level that causes extreme symptoms. This reference by Drake, comes from the Linus Pauling Institute at uh, Oregon State, and it's upsetting. Um, 
now we have people say that we are getting fatter and fatter because we eat an energy rich, nutrient poor diet. Well, think about our broccoli from 1975 and 1997. The change is the broccoli became more energy rich and less nutrient rich or more nutrient poor. That is happening to us and it is happening to the food we eat. Okay. So, what to do? I find the most hopeful thing from what I've said is that comparing different cultivars in those studies that I showed you on the older and more recent varieties show differences. And that means there are genetic differences in plants that affect nutrient density. And if that's so, those genetic differences can be utilized to do plant breeding with nutrient density as the focus. There are more different ways other than simple plant breeding that those genes can be used. And this paper by Rajasri and Pugalendi in the references outlines dozen different ways of using those genetic differences to improve the nutrient density of our food. They could be used for not only breeding, but for transplant experiments, like the ones that created golden rice. And this, I thought this was stunning. Um, a group of scientists, Diaz Legarza et al., used gene editing techniques to affect two genes in tomatoes that are involved in the synthesis of folic acid. And at the end of their experiment, they found that vine-ripened tomato fruits that they had modified the genes of had 25-fold as much folic acid as controlled tomatoes which is terrific. That was in 2004. But has anyone seen folate-rich tomatoes in the supermarket? I haven't. I don't know where that research went. So to make some bottom line statements here, if you are a person who relies upon commercially grown food, then the bottom line is, yes, you can get your required nutrients from vegetables under today's conditions, but you have no choice but to eat more in order to do that. So, and as carbon dioxide continues to increase, this will become more true. So if you want to avoid nutrient insufficiencies, you can use supplements. And as you know, supplements are at least to some degree unregulated in terms of contents and so on. So I'm not sure how reliable these are, but they are there as an option. Or you can simply go ahead and eat more vegetables and try to uh, keep the weight down by increasing your exercise to a level that offsets the elevated carbohydrate consumption. But we are gardeners. And so if you're a home gardener who wants to rely on your garden produce, to meet nutritional needs, then it would be in your best interest to go back to heirloom varieties and avoid, avoid modern high-yielding hybrids. We don't usually need giant cabbages or whatever. Open-pollinated varieties with lower yields are fine for most gardeners. But it's good to, if you learn how to preserve your harvest 
in a way that maintains nutrient quality so that you can um, continue to be nourished over the winter when you're not eating out of your garden. It probably is a good idea to do occasional soil testing to make sure the mineral nutrients are available to your plants. However, if you do all this, with the passage of time and the increase in carbon dioxide levels, your open pollinated plants, old varieties, will still respond in the same way by closing down transpiration and reducing mineral uptake. So at that point, I will say the end. Thank you for inviting me. Here's my email address. I'd be happy to hear from anyone who's interested in this subject and can um, educate me. And I have a couple I have a couple of pages of references that cover what I've talked about, which uh, will be available to you in my recording that you have. So questions. Questions for Muriel. This is just, of course, it's just, it's eye-opening, it's disturbing, <laughs> it's, but it's, uh, you deliver it with such, um, uh, with such flair and such uh, elocution that it's, uh, it's very graspable, Muriel. So I appreciate the fact that you've, uh, you've trans, you've, you've taken your PhD to a level that, you know, that those of us, the normal people can understand it. <laughs> I like to think I'm normal, too. <laughs> Val, please. This begs the question, and I ditto everything that Kelly said. I really appreciated your delivery. Um, is, have any st similar studies been uh, done on farmers, small farmers, who are doing regenerative agriculture, which means letting the microorganisms feed the plants? because commercial people are doing chemical fertilizers and pumping uh, ammonia, uh, whatever it is, um, for uh, nitrogen into the soil and the microorganisms are probably gone from that soil. So I would really be interested to see a study on nutrients that have been vegetables that have been produced by small farmers, which also promotes the small farmer food to table instead of us buying so extensively from commercial growers. I have, <clears throat> I have not seen such a study. I would like to though, but my guess would be that to the extent that fall, sm small farmers make use of older varieties of plants and to the extent that they experience lower yields per plant, you would expect higher nutrient densities. But it, as I said before, expecting what you would see is not the bottom line. Someone has to actually do those measurements. And I'm not aware of that having been done. I sure would like to see that study too, Muriel. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Other questions, please. Are all heirloom varieties, you know, created the same? I mean, should, should we just trust what an heir, you know, when we're, when we're when we're pitched an heirloom variety tomato, you know, mm -hmm. at our nursery, you know, is that um, how reliable, uh, you know, what, what is there? Uh, what what can we do to check this out? Well, that's an interesting question. I would think that all heirloom varieties are not created equal, because we're talking about genetic differences, and all heirloom varieties are genetically different from one another, but no one has done a variety by variety analysis of a nutrient content. I think that should be done. I think that that's information that should appear on the seed packet 
and that nutrient density should be given to us in terms of nutrient content per calorie rather than nutrient content per gram. So, so there is a certain amount of potluck in uh, what you're saying when you choose an heirloom variety. Maybe grow more than one. And um, if you do, like let's say you grow three varieties of beets, not only will you be um, kind of upping your odds of getting good nutrient density, but you'll also be helping to keep those heirloom varieties alive. Are there any secrets that you yourself have at, uh, are, are practicing here in terms of selection of uh, particular varietals or uh, gardening practices? No, I've shared my secrets. I don't have more information <laughs> than you about uh, about different varieties, unfortunately. My hope is that that will be the sort of research that will be ongoing in this area. Other I, questions, comments yeah. from Muriel. I would like to comment on the, the um, fine job that you have done, Muriel. Yes, um, you. You, uh, you almost answered all our questions before we had to ask them. That was a, just a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Other questions, comments from Muriel, from our colleague up in the county to the north. I guess two counties to the north. You have to skip over Jefferson. That's right. Well, Muriel, this has indeed been significant, and as I indicated, uh, you know, before this this will be recorded. It'll be placed on our um, on our, um, uh, our, uh, our our YouTube channel, and we can expect a goodly number of other folks to visit this and to and to um, and delight in your messaging here. Okay. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thank you for the invitation. And I wanted to make sure that folks know that. Um, that the um, the next um, you know just to to, to make sure that uh, before everybody signs off in here is that uh, in May Robin O'Quinn from Eastern Washington University will be speaking with us and it, uh, I think I've uh, I've I, I've uh, 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 I tagged uh, Robin as kind of the at, um, uh, the Doug Tallamy of the West here so it uh, it's going to be a very robust discussion regarding native plants and the importance of rest of rest restoring our native ecosystems here uh, Wendy C Wheeler joins us in June. And she leads the WSU Extension pesticide programs. So it, um, that's a very significant um, uh, program and a very significant uh, capture that we'll have of Wendy and, at, uh, and her comments. But I really want to make sure that we're, at, uh, that we're reflecting all of, um, you know, at, uh, of um, Muriel's uh, uh, comments and uh, taking this all to heart. Uh, there's significant learning that you've shared with us today, Muriel, and, it, uh, and indeed we are hugely appreciative and beneficial because obviously this is knowledge that we can now work in our passing on to, our, to the public with whom we engage. And it's, of course, yeah. it's coming at a very significant time in that this very Saturday, this very Saturday, all of our 2024 interns will be talking about vegetable production. <laughs> so okay. it's just incredibly timely. Perfect. Okay. Any other comments, questions from Muriel? With that, we'll call it a day here. Thank mm -hmm. you all for participating. And it, uh, we look forward to a tremendous amount of volunteer efforts and collaboration during this next month. So it's going to be a busy April, everyone. So saddle up. Goodbye, all. Bye-bye.